Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is Frank Cirillo, author of a really fascinating book called The Abolitionist Civil War. Frank, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Chris. First of all, I want to say this is a lovely book. I love the cover. I mean, just as an artifact, this book is really nice. So uh, kudos to the folks at LSU. Um, So I want to start with these three guys on the front because this book has a fascinating cast of characters that you get to, you know, feature some of them here. What was it like to work with some interesting folks um, to tell their stories? Yeah, so pretty early on in this project, I, I was intended to tell, you know, the entire story of the abolitionist movement during the Civil War. Uh, to kind of update uh, and change a bit what uh, Jim McPherson's seminal work, uh, The Struggle for Equality from the 1960s, did, uh, and add in some things that I think he missed. Uh, for example, I'm sure we'll get into this later, the fact that these abolitionists had this like moral purpose that intertwined their concern for emancipation, but also caring about the United States, the Union, uh, and a bunch of other things. But I realized the best way to get into this would be to to have like a main cast, for lack of a better term, of of 10 people. Uh, And I tried to have people that were uh, representative of all the different uh, factions of the movement, because these were famously very egotistical and fractious people, and they had lots of different factions and divisions in the years before the Civil War. And as my book talks about different divisions during the wartime years, uh, but also the race divides in a movement that was biracial, one of the only biracial movements in the United States at that time. And that was also uh, had a lot of women as well as men as leaders. Again, one of the only movements in the country that was that featured women in prominent roles to the point that a lot of the famous suffragists uh, who later went on to be women's rights leaders, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all started as abolitionists. Uh, so I tried to yeah, narrow that down to 10 people uh, and they were truly fascinating people. So like the, the cover you mentioned, uh, one of those people is not in my main cast. He's a, a British guy uh, <laughs> named George Thompson, who I talk about a great deal. He was an interesting guy. Uh, he uh, was a follower of William Lee Garrison, a close ally of, I'll get to Garrison in a second. But he came over to the United States in the 1830s for a uh, tour to work, go around with William Lloyd Garrison and was very famously like chased out of the country and had to flee with like his tail between his legs because he, w- he would have been uh, lynched otherwise. <laughs> so a really fascinating guy uh, to kind of show you what my book is getting at and how things changed during the war. He comes back uh, to the United States in, during the Civil War and I believe it was 1864 and he speaks on um, in Congress, like to and uh, to like the assembled members of the House of Representatives and the Senate ha- after having a big reception there, and after having a wonderful reception in New York and Boston, Philadelphia, and elsewhere, and then gets uh, is invited to like a private reception with Abraham Lincoln afterwards. And what he says after that, which I found really fascinating, is you know I I was here thirty years ago and I was mobbed, I'm here now. And like they welcomed me on the floor of the Capitol, and I was and still am the same abolitionist. So it's like showing the change of things. Um, William Lloyd Garrison is one of the other figures on the cover. He was one of the founders. He was probably the founder of the organized immediate abolitionist movement. I use a lot of terms. Uh, abolitionists can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, uh, but the immediate abolitionist movement, as I define it, believed really in four main things. They wanted the immediate end of slavery, immediate emancipation. That's why you're, they're immediate abolitionists. You could shorten that to immediatists, and I sometimes do, but I just use abolitionists as shorthand. These are the people I'm talking about. Sure. Um, they wanted some form of rights for African-Americans in the country. So this distinguished them from people who believed in colonization, right? Who said, sure, we want slavery in, but then we want to send the former slaves to Africa, or to the Caribbean, or to somewhere else, abolitionists said, no, we want them here. We want them part of the country after emancipation. What that meant, what part that would be, varied a lot among these people. Anything from 
We want them to be full and equal citizens with, you know, full social and economic equality to, uh, well, no, we just want them on their old plantations, but this time instead of being enslaved, they will be paid like nominal wages to continue producing cash crops. So it varied, but they wanted them there. Uh, and they were not part of a mainstream political party. That's the, the third big thing. So, you know, there are people who I'm sure listeners have heard of, like Charles Sumner or Thaddeus Stevens, who were radical Republicans, right? They they wanted, they also wanted emancipation. They also wanted rights for African Americans, but they were part of a, a mainstream party, the Republican Party, that had a moderate center of mass, right? They were on the very far left wing of their party. The center of the party didn't want anything like that, right? So they had to toe the party line. So they had to, you know, muzzle a lot of their more radical instincts. Abolitionists said, nope. We're not going to do that. We're not going to compromise. We're outside of that. And the fourth thing, which is what I alluded to earlier, is that they believed in some form of uh, redemption of the union. Their purpose was not just to end slavery and to, to uh, you know, have give African Americans a place in the nation afterwards, but it was to thereby redeem the nation. So they they were very strong nationalists, very strong patriots who believed. That the United States had a divine mission, like the, the Declaration of Independence was inspired by God, and that the United States was supposed to be this beacon of democracy for the world, right? It was the first and greatest experiment in self-government, in democracy, and it could light the way, it could be a lighthouse to burn away the evils of oppression and tyranny in the old world, in Europe. But slavery had become a cancer, Right. It had, it had taken the United States away from its true purpose and, and it put it on this path of sin and error. So they saw their mission as restoring it to its true path, letting the United States be the divine beacon of democracy it was always supposed to be. So anyway, long <laughs> to get back to the question, William Lloyd Garrison was the founder of this movement in 1833. He was inspired by African-American antecedents uh, who were uh, pushing back against the colonization movement in the U.S. And, and he founded the movement. There were later divisions against him, but he was the founder. And the guy sitting next to him was uh, Wendell Phillips, who was his closest lieutenant, uh, best friend. Um, very different backgrounds. Garrison was just a, a you know middle lower middle class, uh, like a newspaper man from. Uh, up, up from uh, Newburyport, Massachusetts, and Wendell Phillips was like a Boston Brahmin, like blue blood, rich, rich, you know, like his descended from like mayors and like pilgrim Puritan leaders and whatever, uh, but be uh, became the closest of friends. Like William Lloyd Garrison named one of his sons after Wendell Phillips. They were they were bosom buddies until the Civil War. When I talk about they they had some major splits and and became a uh, almost mortal enemies. <laughs> So to answer your question, it was, it was really fascinating working with all these people. They're, uh, they're human, you know, right? So they, uh, they make mistakes. They have egos, uh, probably the strongest egos of anyone I've ever encountered are the abolitionists. They, they really think, I mean, I, I agree that they're important, but they really think they're important. <laughs> so, uh, so they were, they were fascinating figures to deal with all their trials and tribulations and their, their flaws as people. What I really liked about this approach and sort of, you know, that's why I wanted to start with kind of the cast of characters. And it reminded me a little bit about um, Joseph Ellis's approach in Founding Brothers, uh, Founding Brothers, excuse me, where, you know, we sort of think about this monolithic group of founding fathers, but really they're kind of like squabbling brothers, right? And so we think of the abolitionists as this uh, monolithic group and abolitionists with a capital A is, you know, this one group of people, but here you're showing us like there are lots of splits and divisions and squabbles and, and they come to life really well in the book through these, the lens of these people, as opposed to, you know, maybe just kind of talking about it from a more theoretic point of view. And so I, I really appreciated that about the book a lot, you know, and, and bringing these people into sharp contrast. So um, let's talk about that a little bit because people do assume yeah. that abolitionists is just one big group. They're mm -hmm. super influential and, uh, as your book gets into, um, there are lots of different gradients to all of that. Um, what was yeah. that like to try to wrangle? It was difficult. So, I mean, the the traditional like scholarship on abolitionists, like 
ha has always talked about how there is these like two main divisions among the abolitionists in the decades before the Civil War. So remember, the abolitionist, immediate abolitionist movement. Again, there were previous abolitionist movements. That's I'm just talking about this group. Immediate abolitionists founded by Garrison, et cetera. Founded, so it was founded in 1833. Uh, and the movement officially, like the main society officially disbands in 1870. So like most studies really only cover the pre-war years. They don't really talk about the war years because they just focus more on Lincoln and the Republicans and emancipation. So they are talk about the main divisions before the war. So, but I had to chart out all these divisions that I saw happening during the war, which were totally different. So I try to make it as clear and unconfusing as possible, but I see all these different realignments happening during the war. Um, but I could just start by talking about what was going on before. That's what, I, that's what, if you read like a scholarly book on the abolitionist movement uh, that talks about the pre-war years, which they mostly do, it'll say these two divisions. So like there are a lot of confusing terms, but like the easiest way to say it is the followers of William Lee Garrison were Garrisonians, right? Okay. That, that's the easiest term to use. They did call themselves that. Um, so Garrison again founded the movement, but a lot of people split away from his leadership in 1840. And so the division in the decades before the Civil War is Garrisonians and non-Garrisonians. So the Garrisonians, uh, first off, believed uh, in not getting involved in politics. Like they didn't, uh, they believed the entire American political system was corrupt, starting with the Constitution, right? So they, they loved the Declaration of Independence. They thought the Constitution was pro-slavery. So they didn't want to be involved in the political system that it created. They just wanted to start a new, rip it up. Uh, to the point that uh, William Lloyd Garrison actually at like a 4th of July celebration before the war went on stage and burned the Constitution, <laughs> which is quite a thing to do. <laughs> An inflammatory act, but I'm bummed. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, and he would refer to it as a, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. So yeah, not not much subtlety. It's it's pretty uh -huh. clear what he believes. So, so he hates the Constitution uh, and therefore doesn't want to be involved in the political system uh, and he also believes in a complicated thing called disunion. So like some people think when they say disunion, they meant like the same thing as what the Southerners meant with secession. No, not really. Uh, they believe that essentially like the uh, slave system was allowed to continue because the North provided all of these protections, like fugitive slave clauses and protections to the Southern states. So if the North just leaves the Union temporarily, then, oh, suddenly fugitive slaves, they don't have to flee to Canada. They just have to flee to Pennsylvania, right. you know, and this the system will fall apart and then everyone will reunite and slavery will be over. It's very idealistic. Uh, a lot of people didn't think it made a whole lot of sense, but that's what they believed, right? But in any event, uh, some people during the Civil War tried to equate that with Southern secessionists. No, like they, they were, their whole idea was to bring the nation back together like eventually, they thought it might not take too long, but they wanted the nation reunited without slavery. They didn't want a permanent separation. Anyway, those are the Garrisonians. Then the uh, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Wendell Phillips, some of the other people that I feature in my cast, uh, Moncure Conway, really fascinating Virginia guy who was uh, grew up like a Virginia slaveholding secessionist and converted to abolitionism. Um, happy to talk about him later. Weird, but interesting guy. But then there's the non-Garrisonians, the people who fought against Garrison. Uh, there were a few reasons for that. One was because Garrison was in favor of women's rights and featured women in prominent roles, and a lot of people didn't like that, so they left. Uh, another reason was a lot of abolitionists thought that the Constitution was actually anti-slavery, that the founders had actually created mechanisms in the Constitution to eventually end slavery, to choke slavery, to corner it, and then eventually kill it. Uh, and so they thought, we can actually use this political system and we can actually create our own political parties, you know, not work with the mainstream guys, the, the Whigs or the Republicans or the Democrats. We'll create our own like pure abolitionist parties and we'll work in the system within the system to change it. Uh, and so they also didn't believe in disunion. They thought disunion was a crazy idea. And the, the most famous of these guys was uh, Frederick Douglass, who I'm sure your listeners have heard of. Uh, he was a escaped slavery in Maryland. 
uh, fled eventually to Massachusetts. And he actually started out as a Garrisonian. He was uh, kind of William Lloyd Garrison's protege and Garrison was his mentor, uh, but they were very, very strong personalities, eventually chafed against each other, uh, especially because Garrison could be rather controlling. Uh, and Douglas wanted to strike out on his own as a newspaper editor. So Garrison edited one of the biggest newspapers in uh, the abolitionist movement called The Liberator. Douglas wanted to strike out on his own. They eventually had a really big break, uh, just spewed venom and fire at each other for the 10 years before the Civil War. And Douglas became a non-Garrisonian, decided, uh, said, declared publicly the Constitution is anti-slavery and they became enemies. So that was the, the division before the war. So things start changing because uh, in the, the few years before the war with the rise of this Republican party, right? So the Republicans uh, emerged because the slave South kept trying to expand slavery into the territories, right? The United States back then, this, the organized states were very, not that many of them. Right. There was all this unincorporated territory from the Louisiana Purchase, from the war with Mexico that were being organized into states. Uh, and the slaveholders wanted to have slavery in all, pretty much all those places. A Republican Party organized to stop that. They didn't, their platform was not to end slavery or certainly to, you know, give black citizenship. It was to stop the expansion of slavery further from where it already existed. Uh, and abolitionists were to, started to divide over whether what this meant. So regardless of if they were Garrisonians or non-Garrisonians, a lot of abolitionists start to, started to feel, well, we've been at this, right? So this is like, let's say like 1858, okay? So they've been at it for 25 years. They haven't ended slavery. Like slavery has expanded, like it's gotten worse. And like the slave power like are, is in control of like Congress, uh, and it's the president is like essentially a puppet of the slave power at this point, James Buchanan and everyone before him, things have gotten worse. So maybe what we've been doing isn't working. <laughs> maybe we should, like, and maybe things are just getting bad and we should become, and they got kind of desperate. Uh, they started getting really pessimistic and desperate and they was, began thinking, well, maybe instead of only doing what we've been doing in the past, which is being like, pure, you know, we got to use our moral means to get to moral ends. We have to be righteous. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve anything. Maybe we should just use expedient means, whatever is at hand, right? If there's like a party that shows up like the Republicans, well, yeah, we don't like them. They're not perfect. But if they can help us get to our goal, we should use them, right? Maybe we should work with them. Uh, so again, this is people who are Garrisonians, like Garrison and Wendell Phillips, uh, and Moncure Conway, and people who are non-Garrisonians, uh, like Frederick Douglass. So this is a, a shift, a realignment, right? These old divisions are starting not to matter as much. And I refer to these people who wanted to get involved with those Republicans as interventionists and saying, essentially, we need to intervene, we need to get involved and work with these people if we want to change things. But there were a few other people. Uh, the most famous are a married couple, na couple named Abby Kelly Foster and Stephen Simmons Foster, uh, who I call moral purists, who said essentially, no, we have to stick to the old ways. You need to use moral ends to uh, moral means to achieve moral ends, because first off, uh, you won't achieve anything if you use immoral means, right? You're never going to get the thing you're trying to get in the first place, but also you'll corrupt yourself. You'll lose sight of some of your more radical goals uh, if you're just, you know, working with the political mainstream, getting involved in the political system, you'll just lose sight of some of your ideals and you'll corrupt yourself and you'll just destroy our entire movement. So they fought over this. And then when the war broke out, that pretty much transferred into the interventionists supported the Union War. They realized that they could, uh, so they, they supported it not because they believed Lincoln wanted to end slavery at the start of the war. He didn't, right? It was a war to preserve the Union. He made that clear. Uh, he was upholding the Constitution. But they believed they could essentially try and convince the Union, the North, that uh, ending slavery was necessary to win the war, right? That it was expedient. That was a military necessity because slavery powered the Confederate war effort. 
Uh, the fact that there were slaves laboring on Southern plantations freed up white Southern men to go fight at the front. Uh, they powered this Confederate economy. So if you take away those slaves, if you if you turn them out from Confederate assets into Union assets, you just turn the tide of the war. So they believe they can essentially convince the North and Abraham Lincoln to end the war by their getting involved. Where a moral purist said, nope, like what you're doing is, is evil. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is just as bad as Jefferson Davis, uh, which is quite a thing to say, but they said it all. <laughs> uh, and by doing this, you're just essentially, you're, you're not going to achieve emancipation. You're definitely not going to get rights for Blacks, and you're just going to you're going to destroy our movement and things went along further in the war but i'll i'll, I'll leave off for now we could get into that later if you want well, well and, and it seems that you know popular understanding you know maybe paints this picture where everybody in the north was an abolitionist and there that's what started the war and once the war started the abolitionists were able to convert it into this war against slavery um but sort of the voices of the abolitionist movement, very split and splintered, but also not nearly as dominating as, as sort of popular memory remembers it to be. Uh, give us a little bit of that context, just how influential or not are these voices before they then start working with the system? Oh, so uh, I would argue not much at all. Uh, <laughs> so that's part of why they changed the strategy, right? So I don't, People have asked me in the past, like, what percentage of people in the North do you think were abolitionists? Like, 10%? And say, no. Like, 1%? I mean, probably less than that. But maybe wow. half a percent. Wow. <laughs> like, and, and that's so contrary to the way most people sort of uh, understand what abolitionism right. was about, right? Most people in the North were uh, didn't really care about the slavery issue. Like, if you press them, they would say, oh, yeah, we don't want to slavery to expand. Uh, but that's not because they cared as in a moral sense or that because they wanted to help African-Americans. It's because they wanted the land in the West, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, and else, elsewhere for white farmers to, to go West and have their own freeholds instead of for like nest Southern plantations. Yeah. Essentially, they wanted to keep slavery and slaves specifically out, out of the West. So the, these, these um, what I would call it is they... They wouldn't, most of them wouldn't mind if slavery eventually ended, but they certainly weren't voting on that issue and they, they weren't moved enough to, to care about it in any other sense. Uh, and uh, abolitionists, yeah, we're, we're not, we're greeted generally with the mobs, with uh, fire and brimstone, you know, people pelting them with rocks and threatening to lynch them wherever they went. Uh, so uh, when, the, when these uh, southern states, when the seven and then became 11 Southern states seceded in the spring of 1860, a lot of the abolitionists were saying, well, maybe this will turn out well and gave speeches to their effect saying, uh, maybe secession will actually be a good thing. And yeah, they were attacked with mobs. Everyone just tried to kill them. Wow. Uh, I received, I got a letter from one person talking about how he was chased all across. Um, so I'm currently at, in Ann Arbor uh, and they were chased. This guy was chased across the entire town of Ann Arbor, apparently by an angry mob <laughs> trying to murder him. I'm sure he exaggerated. That's what he said. Yeah. Uh, not long after that, uh, when the war starts, Wendell Phillips uh, is talking to a guy who becomes his later his son-in-law, and he says, "Like, I think what we've been doing isn't really working, um, and I'm I'm a little worried because I'm debating should I like renounce." 30 years of what I've been doing, all my tactics, like renounce my old beliefs and start supporting the Union War because it will achieve a greater end. Uh, and he ultimately, he goes back and forth on this. It's it's a mass moral dilemma because these people have been viewing themselves as these kind of, again, egotists, but they they view themselves as these kind of saints, right? They're above the fray. They They are these like wise sages who can see the path of the nation, but they can do that because they're objective, because they're above the political fray. And they're all of a sudden they're thinking, well, we need to get involved and in people aren't listening to us. We're not influential. To become influential, we need to descend. We need to go down into the swim, may wade into the mainstream and leave our, you know, our heavenly, you know, heights. Uh, but that's really hard <laughs> for, for, for these people to do, but they do. And they do become more influential that way. 
because not uh, because they consciously start crafting their arguments to say, you know, don't end slavery because it's wrong. End slavery because it will bring your brothers, your sons, your your fathers home from the war. It will win the war, bring your your you know, your your loved ones back alive, and punish these traitors who are you know killing, you know, uh, these brave men in blue. So, uh, do they help make the argument that the war is about slavery? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they weren't the only ones saying this. So like radical Republicans were saying this, but I do actually think that, um, so I talk about how pretty early on in the war by like May, 1861, by like May, June of 1861. So like the war starts in April, uh, by like the late spring, they've started putting together what I call these talking points, these axioms, uh, these interlocking arguments to talk about, uh, yeah, the why slavery should end. So yeah, one, it was that slavery caused the war, like the South seceded for slavery and like supremacy. Two, slavery powers the Confederate war effort as we talked about earlier. Uh, three, permanent peace isn't possible while slavery is still around because if you just compromise, right? Like the, the North had been compromising at the South all the time. If you just compromise and say, okay, you can come back, you keep slavery. What's to stop them from doing again the next time there's a presidential election? They don't like the results. They'll just do it again. Uh, so therefore, or you need to end slavery to ensure a permanent union. Uh, and five, the way to do that is through the Constitution. So William Lloyd Garrison, the guy who had burned the Constitution, is all of a sudden saying, hey, there is this clause called the War Powers Clause of the, Con of the U.S. Constitution, and we should definitely use this to end slavery. Lincoln specifically should use it. So it's quite a turnaround. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so they, they do, yeah. Uh, so I want to back up to just uh, something you said a second ago before we get too far away. And we were talking yeah, sort of yeah. about this moral crusade that the abolitionists had. Um, and I, I find it kind of interesting, you know, that they take that perspective because, of course, there are people in the clergy, for instance, in the South who also sort of take that moral uh quote unquote, high road to justify slavery. And so, I mean, it seems like really shaky ground to base your entire argument on um, from a moral perspective, because, you know, there are people who are doing the same thing to, to argue the opposite perspective. Yeah. I mean, I teach that in my classes all the time because people just assume, oh, you know, everyone just believed that uh, anti-slavery was the moral side. It's like, no. They both had ammunition to use, um, whether you wanted to talk about the intentions of the founders and the constitution or to quote the Bible, uh, there was both ammunition. Arguably there was actually more ammunition for the pro-slavery side in the Bible. Uh, and they took full advantage of that. Uh, but yeah, it was most certainly shaky ground. And whatever, whenever there was a moral argument made by the North, it would be mirrored by the South. So um, people have probably heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, but what people probably haven't heard of is that there were a lot of novels written by Southern women, which we collectively call the anti-Tom novels, such as Aunt Phyllis's Cabin, <laughs> which mirrored it to uh, to present a sympathetic pro-slavery position, talk about how the white slaveholders were kind to their slaves and it was good for the slaves. So yeah, so there, it, there was no definite... Uh, side that had like the, the moral high ground in this because each was claiming it right. and it certainly made it hard uh i think what tipped the scales for most northerners is the fact that the southerners had seceded and had become traitors to the union which they cared about like it's it's one of my mentors uh gary gallagher always talks about it's it's very hard for us to imagine why a guy in like northern maine on the canada border would decide to like would go while will, willingly into the army to go to fight in a you know in Georgia, and the reason is because they cared very very deeply about the founding experiment about the United States and the Union. Like it was a nation that had mo probably their grandfathers yeah. at this point had fought for um, and died for, and they believed it was this like this great experiment. Of liberty and they didn't want to see it die and they believed that the southerners were trying to kill it 
right? So the fact that these guys have left the union have tipped the scales for most people in the North thinking, well, the abolitionists are probably right. But again, they're not voting for moral reasons. They're, they're voting and they're, they're starting to advocate emancipation because it's necessary, because it's an expediency. Uh, and that is a tension. That's a problem because remember, abolitionists don't just want emancipation. They also want rights for African-Americans. And they just assume, oh, well, we'll get these people on board. And then they'll probably get on board with rights for African-Americans too. Like, that's not really the case. <laughs> they, they want what's expedient for them. Like, so like, yeah, like ending slavery is going to help bring their loved ones home. But like, that doesn't mean you have to give Black people the right to vote. <laughs> and and they, they, there's certainly that issue. Yeah, so I mean, it, it struck me that you know there's this contingent within the movement that they want basically the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth amendments right now, mm -hmm. um, and make it all happen in the midst of this national turmoil. And you've got gradients of of um, other folks in the in in the movement who want a little less or a little less than that, a little less than mm -hmm. that, and they're and and so the book really kind of tries to weave through all of this and i don't want you to give away the store but um in the midst of a national crisis there's this serious divisiveness within the abolitionist movement about how to move forward um how to take advantage of the opportunity without looking like you're exploiting um tell us a little bit about that really difficult ground that the movement itself has to try to to figure out yeah uh so with reconstruction specifically or i mean even just during the war you know like yeah. as, as they're trying to kind of figure this out and you know what do we yeah. want this to look like now yeah? yeah so it's so again so there's this division among interventionists and moral purists right uh over whether we should get involved in the war and the interventionists all want to get involved they want to support the union the moral purists don't want to get involved in this at all um, so the way I like to see it is these two groups, these two factions, whatever, are divided over uh, the means to a more perfect union. I, I refer to it as a moral union. Uh, how do you get there? But then there are some divisions among this pro war group, among the interventionists, over what that more perfect union actually looks like, right? What does that actually mean in the end? Uh, I don't want to get into the technical terms. But in short, people like William A. Garrison uh, had a very narrow definition of what black freedom meant. Uh, they were the, the people who said, yeah, essentially African-Americans should just remain on their old plantations and work for nominal wages, right? That's, that's enough for us. Uh, whereas people like Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips and others had a much broader, more expansive interpretation saying we want full equality for African Americans, uh, and they came to believe you know, in legislated equality. So, you know, constitutional amendments, uh, acts of Congress, stuff like that, to ensure full political, social, economic, civil, every every form of equality for African Americans. Uh, and the anti-war guys, the moral purists, also wanted rights for African, like full rights for African Americans. Um, so this split among the pro war guys is kind of on the back burner during the first years of the war right because they're all working together they they want their first goal they want emancipation done and we can worry about the rest later well um they eventually do help get this done i argue because they've really been working on influencing public opinion over the first years of the war not just by making their arguments but by allying with politicians so remember, they had not wanted anything to do with politicians before the war. All of a sudden, they're relying first with like radical Republicans like Sumner, who are their most you know natural allies because they have a lot of the same beliefs. But they get more and more moderate with their allies. Uh, Edward Everett, who was a former governor of Massachusetts, who's probably best known for uh, spending the three hours before Lincoln's Gettysburg Address delivering a speech that no one remembers. Um, was a was a moderate guy. He supported colonization. He was like an enemy of the abolitionists before the war, but he starts supporting emancipation. Not rights for African Americans, but emancipation. And the abolitionists decide we can work with those guys too. They can work with everyone. So they began using these allies to get out their message, to get out their arguments. Uh, they become popular, which I 
I won't get go down that that road for now. But they they become popular themselves, go to Congress, et cetera. They eventually help convince Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. But after that, all of a sudden, oh wait, this is a new world now, and uh, we just got our main goal, first goal, and now what are we going to do now? And it becomes clear their their divisions are now among these pro war guys are have suddenly all of a sudden starting from like January 1860 on 63 on are much bigger than their similarities so you just see all these splits uh you see the the narrow guys like Garrison uh just break with the 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 more expansive guys like Wendell Phillips uh it becomes mixed up in the presidential election of 1864 with Garrison supporting Abraham Lincoln and Wendell Phillips and uh, for a bit, Frederick Douglass supporting opponents of, of Abraham Lincoln. It just becomes really confusing. Uh, and this turns by the end of the war into essentially, uh, you know, when the Union wins, uh, the 13th Amendment is passed, ending slavery. Garrison says, uh, who is president of the leading society of the abolitionist movement, it's called the American Anti-Slavery Society, uh, has been president for decades. And he essentially says, our job is done. Like, we did it. Uh, we don't need anything else, you know, like it'd be cool, it'd be nice if African Americans have some rights, but that's not our job. Our job is only emancipation. And uh, so therefore we can I, we can end the abolitionist movement, our, our work is done. Whereas then you've got the purists and you get the, these people like Wendell Phillips saying, well, hold on, hold on, Garrison. When you founded the movement, you created like, it was called the Declaration of Sentiments, but it was a, a manifesto saying like our mission is to end slavery and uh, help create all rights for African-Americans. And they're like, I think you're forgetting the second part there, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's, there, there is more in what your original mission was. And it seems like you have lost sight of that, uh, which I would argue he had in a way. I would argue that, remember, I know I'm covering a lot of ground, but remember, Back decades earlier, like before the war, these these purists had said, if you get involved in the system, if you get if you intervene in the system, you're going to corrupt yourself and lose sight of your goals. I'd argue Garrison did. Uh, he came. He lost sight of his support of rights for African Americans. Came to just believe in emancipation. So he tries to disband the anti slavery society. Uh, he fails in a vote. Uh, most people vote against him, so he just resigns and retires. Uh, so that leaves the people. The remaining people, so like Wendell Phillips becomes the head of, of the society. Frederick Douglass helps him out. Uh, the Fosters are involved, and they try to get involved in Reconstruction, uh, try to get these amendments passed. Um, and they're able to do so. Uh, they're, they're a little worried uh, because, again, Northerners don't care about rights for African Americans. That's what they're trying to do. Uh, they're only able to do so because, essentially, the, Southern, the white Southerners overplay their hand. Uh, so after Lincoln's assassination in April 1865, Andrew Johnson becomes the president and he goes uh, really overboard in uh, his pro-Southern actions. Uh, he uh, like uh, revokes like the 40 acres and a mule order from, from William Tecumseh Sherman. So there's none of that. Uh, he restores, uh, he lets all the former Confederates come back into Congress. So like the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, like returns to Congress from Georgia. Uh, he allows all these things called black codes, which essentially just reinstitutes slavery. Uh, and it, yeah, so it's, uh, that essentially radicalizes the North. The abolitionists, the remaining abolitionists see an opening and say, hey, okay, maybe we could get something out of this. And they do and eventually help get the 14th to 15th amendments to get suffrage for uh, black men. Uh, it's hard, uh, and they don't get anything else done, but they do eventually get to that. It seems to me that like once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued and, and went into effect, there's this tiger by the tail moment where yeah. the abolitionists are like, oh, we got what we wanted. Now what? Mm -hmm. And you know, if we sort of let go, we're going to be in trouble. If we hold on, we're going to be in trouble. And maybe that, that inability to, to know the answer to now what um, – yeah, has serious repercussions all the way through Reconstruction, where there's not like a clear sense of what this is all supposed to accomplish. 
No, they're kind of figuring it out along the way. And it's partly because like most, you know, looking back, you know, in hindsight, we think, well, oh, everyone, you know, right in like 1859 thought, oh, there's going to be a civil war and slavery is going to end soon. It's like, no, <laughs> like certain, like the abolitionists thought slavery might end in like the lives of their grandchildren, right? <laughs> like if they continue it inching forward, it like they did not think slavery was going to end in their own lifetimes. And as a result, they weren't really thinking all that hard about what was coming after because they didn't have to, right? All of a sudden during the war, it's, it starts zooming toward them and they start thinking, oh, oh no, we, we actually have to start thinking about what's going to come after this. So they are on the fly kind of figuring out their ideas where Garrison Carts starts, you know, moving away from anything beyond and Phillips and Douglas, who, I mean, to be fair, like they always wanted stuff beyond emancipation, but they become much more concrete in what that means and thinking, oh, we can have constitutional amendments and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it is certainly an issue and creates all these problems and divisions, but I would argue it's also the fact that it was, they just kept all this so vague, allowed them, these people with, as it would turn out, very different beliefs and understandings of post-emancipation stuff, it would allow them to work together, like, and be friends uh, before the war, right? Because you didn't have to think about it. I, I don't know, like, if they, if they just start if Garrison and Wendell Phillips just started out talking about their really different ideas. I don't know if they could have ever worked together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, um, and you end the book with this really, I think a really neat story about Garrison getting invited to the flag raising at Fort Sumter. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you talk about how like he had been on the fringe for so long and now look, he is, he's mainstream as a symbol for this. Um how, how how symbolic is that moment for the overall movement and its its aims? And I suppose there's a different answer from the um, the really you know narrow viewed folks versus the more expansive folks. I mean, no, it's it's huge uh, for everyone involved. So so I mentioned you know abolitionists start to become more popular, like as people start paying attention to them. So yeah, like by early 1862, they become like celebrities. So like they're not being attacked by mobs. They're being greeted by cheering crowds. They're being invited to speak to the Congress. They're being invited to meet with Lincoln. Uh, they get to go, a few of them, including Wendell Phillips uh, and Moncure Conway, get to go and uh, deliver lectures at the Smithsonian. Uh, Garrison actually isn't invited that to that because he's considered too controversial and he uh, is not happy about it. <laughs> he, he, he complains quite a bit about that. <laughs> uh, but after he begins supporting Lincoln and becomes more in with the establishment, he actually do, he does get to uh, meet Lincoln. And then, yeah, he uh, is invited by Edwin Stanton, the, the U.S. Secretary of War, to attend the flag raising at Fort Sumter. So the U.S. takes back Fort Sumter, where the war began in Charleston Harbor. They take it back in 1865. And on the four years to the day, you know, in April 1865, he is like a honored guest at this raising the flag. And it's just like, it, yeah, it's it's hard to overstate like how symbolic that is and important. Uh, and while he's there, you know, he marches in a parade of African-Americans through the city and he meets his son, who is a uh, one of the officers of an African-American regiment who just like, who goes on leave to go meet his dad in Charleston, which again, was like the cradle of the Confederacy. South Carolina was this first state to secede. It is like the most rapidly pro-slavery area possible. And like that, the founder of the abolitionist movement is now just like walking freely as like an honored guest here. It's hard to overstate it, yeah. how important that is. But he does see that as affirmation that my work is done, right? Is it like you can't get any better than this? This is like this is a symbol that like we 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 can wrap up now, which obviously not everyone agreed with. So he has that moment. Would you consider the larger movement a success or not? So I'd say that it's complicated. Uh, the way I which, like which is a great answer, by the way. So <laughs> thank you. The way I like to say it most succinctly, I know I've going on too long and some of my answers. The way I say most succinctly is the abolish the what the abolitionists did during the war helped explain how the war achieved both so much and so little in terms of justice for African Americans. 
so much, but because it was the by it was the getting involved, it was the intervening in the war, creating these expedient arguments, along with politicians, that really helped make emancipation happen. It it brought uh, public opinion in the North up uh, to the point that it would persuade Lincoln to act. Uh, it brought political opinion in Lincoln's own party up to the point that it would persuade Lincoln to act. And I'd argue it played a, an important role in making emancipation happen, obviously alongside you know milita larger military events. The course of the military course of the war was pretty important to that well. And abolitionists understood that. They just thought, as long as we have enough time, as long as the war keeps going, we'll eventually be able to do something. And I'd argue that they did. Um, of course, they, they they do run out of time with Lincoln's do. assassination, with the, you know, the way Reconstruction unfolds. Uh, yeah. and, and that becomes problematic kind of, I guess, for the quote unquote end of the story. It does, because uh, no one knows what Lincoln would have done after the war. I mean, in his last speech, he was hinting at uh, voting rights for African-American soldiers like who had fought in the army. Uh, but the, yeah, so the, the so little, the end of my story is because uh, by getting involved, people like Garrison, you know, they they lost sight of some of their more radical goals. They diluted their goals and abandoned the movement. And I'd argue that really he and his followers, who were some of the most influential people, you know, they led the abolitionist newspapers. They were the leaders of its societies. They were the most some of the most influential people. They're suddenly gone. They take the numbers, the resources, their influence with them. And you've just you've got Phillips, Douglas, the Fosters and others trying to continue uh, and after Andrew Johnson gives them an opening, they do help get the 15th Amendment passed. But they're only able to do stuff as long as people think, OK, now maybe some rights for African-Americans, maybe that's expedient now because we don't want the Confederates dominating us again. As soon as uh, other issues take precedence, like uh, migration from Europe, uh, labor strikes, uh, a panic, a depression, a, mon a money depression in 1873, as soon as these other things start mattering, People don't really care about any of this anymore. They say, well, let's just move on. You know, the, the, the Southerners can have control in the Southern states. We don't really care. And abolitionists can't really do anything. Uh, and they themselves say, you know, we just don't have the power. We don't have the numbers anymore. We don't have the influence. We can't do anything anymore. And uh, we don't, they, they just eventually give up. So that's the so little. But that that is why it's complicated. They couldn't have achieved anything so much without getting involved, but by doing so, they caused themselves to eventually fail and achieve so little. So that's it's all wrapped up together. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so complicated. That's a great answer. So, so it, it seems to me though, like despite that complication or that complicatedness, um, on some level, abolitionists won the war for memory because right. everybody today would say like, oh, abolitionists, I know what they are. I know what they did. I know who they were. Uh, and and they have that outsized role in the, the pre-war history that you and I talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. why, why or how is it that they end up winning the war of memory? I'd say it's uh, the civil rights movement <laughs> in short. So, so they've definitely won the war for memory now. But uh, if you read a history book, by like a prominent historian or uh, watched a movie or anything uh, having to do with the Civil War pretty much from like 1880 through 1960, it would be extremely pro-Confederate and pro-slavery for the most part uh, um, in a white media source, in a not not a black media source. It would be extreme. So there is this idea called the Lost Cause that essentially promoted uh, the South, the, the pre-war South is this beautiful, like halcyon, like idealistic place where the slaves were happy and everything was great. And the North and the Union corrupted that and destroyed it and turned the, the happy slaves against their masters. And it led to just evil and chaos. I mean, the most, uh, you know, classic example of this is the movie Gone with the Wind, uh, which is just that viewpoint with, uh, with beautiful music and good acting, <laughs> um, so it looks pretty. <laughs> it looks it looks it looks beautiful. I mean, it's seductive. I'll, I'll, like I I I taught a class on the memory of the Civil War and would just show my students that, and they were like, "Yeah, we could see why this is so seductive." It's like, yeah, it's soaring beautiful music. There's there's a reason they did this. Uh, the civil rights movement really starts changing that in the 1960s. Martin Luther King, etc. 
uh, who invokes the Civil War and Emancipation pretty often. I mean, in his I Have a Dream speech, among many others. Uh, that uh, leads the historical field, which until then had been dominated by essentially lost cause scholars. It leads to a total reevaluation of uh, the legacy of the Civil War, of Reconstruction and others, and uh, that leads to prominent more prominence in like the abolitionists. So, like I mentioned, James McPherson is a, a prominent historian who uh, thankfully is still with us, who uh, wrote a book on the abolitionists and the Civil War. And that's one of the first instances, like he wrote that in the 60s. So it's like, that is one of the first of this new wave of scholarship, like cutting edge at the time thinking, saying all of a sudden, the abolitionists aren't these evil villains, right? If you look at like, gone out the wind, they're not mentioned, but Birth of a Nation, like a really infamous, terrible movie, they're evil, they're the villains. They're like the cartoonish bad guys. So all of a sudden you've got historians saying, they're not the bad guys, they were the good guys. <laughs> It just totally changes. And uh, since then, you know, Glory and uh, other movies and Lincoln, they've become been seen as, as the heroes, as the protagonists. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's always changing. It's always, uh, and I don't know what the future will hold, but, you know, I, I mean, I do agree that they were the good guys, but I am <laughs> as a product of this, of this new wave. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly agree with the good guys. I think some scholars maybe go too far in saying that they were perfect, uh, which they were not. And I, I do try to push back against that and say like they, they have flaws and their failures are, you know, as a product of what they did. Like it, they didn't just, they weren't just perfect. But So Frank, is there anything about your book I haven't asked that I should have? Uh, I mean, I think... That was pretty much the main argument. Um, there are some interesting like characters and anecdotes I'd be happy to talk about further if, if you if you have time. Yeah, I do want to I, I want to have you talk about Monique uh, Conway because you mentioned him twice and both times you're like, and this guy is a character. So I gotta we I gotta hear more about this guy here real quick. Yeah. So uh again, he was like the uh the heir of a Virginia slave holding dynasty. Uh uh went to school in the north, was you know, like college kids these days was radicalized <laughs> came out of it like yeah fire heart like firebrand diehard left uh became yeah became an abolitionist uh got involved in the movement was close to garrison uh and he was uh the garrison and others saw he was useful because right he's a southerner he had been a success like as a as a young teenager he had been like a leader of secession society so he like has this perspective an insider perspective on what these guys are doing and what their motivations are like he he knows that they just cared about slavery and white supremacy because he was doing the same thing 10 years ago so he can tell you like in your his speeches and books uh but he's a weird weird guy uh one of the most like i mean one of the pivotal moments of my book that i talk about is essentially um so england and france like don't ever recognize the confederacy uh, but there's some fears that they might do so, like so, like and by recognizing the independence of the Confederacy, that'll just that'll you know lead the South to win the war. Okay, so um, Con Moncure Conway essentially volunteers for an abolition mission to go over and stop that. And to like, uh, there's a Confederate like he's not an ambassador because it's not an official country, but he's like an envoy. Um, and it's kind of like counter this envoy and and trying to persuade the British to not recognize the Confederacy. Like all the abolitionists kind of want someone to do this. Moncure Conway eventually like signs up for it and the other abolitionists agree and they eventually say, okay, though like you know, when he appear, when he comes to the office to like be debriefed, but, like to be briefed before uh, leaving, like he's like extremely like unwashed and like unshaven. And they say, like, we're gonna give you a shave, man. <laughs> <laughs> like the British, the British like people who don't <laughs> look like that. Uh, so they, they literally do <laughs> shave him and give him nice clothes and then send him to London. Uh, but he eventually, uh, within a couple of weeks, he eventually decides, like, here's a great idea. Like, I'm going to make an offer on behalf of the entire abolitionist movement, like, which he didn't have the ability to do, to the Confederate envoy and say, like, if you agree, if, if you, the Confederacy, agree to end slavery, we abolitionists will support the independence of the Confederacy. 
Like he was doing this to try and trick the guy into saying like, no, you silly abolitionists will never end slavery. And then Conway could say, oh, look, look, British people, like he he's never going to end slavery. You don't support him. But the guy wasn't stupid and, and just uh, refused to answer and just published Conway's correspondence. And that essentially uh, led everyone to uh, to attack Conway. He was he essentially became a persona non grata uh, in America and especially among the abolitionists and just lived in self-imposed exile like for pretty much the rest of his life as a result of that. A truly, truly weird and bizarre, I guess. <laughs> well, a great cast of characters. The book is The Abolitionist Civil War, Immediates and the Struggle to Transform the Union by Frank Cirillo from LSU Press. Frank, thanks for taking some time to chat with us today. Thanks so much, Chris. This has been fascinating. I'm Chris Bukowski for the Emerging Civil War podcast. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.